Get ready. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed are tracked and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Can you hear the disclaimer? Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither BillStockWorld.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective officers, personnel, representatives. Agents or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. The DOCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. Okay, so you guys can hear that dis that uh, disclosure, right? Because um, this is my old webinar computer and on the new one you can't hear, but apparently on this one you can. So tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you just heard that, right? Anyway, all right, getting on to more important things. Let's find the um, Apple Live event. All right, and let's see who's got a good one. Um, YouTube, remember CNET, should we watch it, CNET? CNET's pretty good. Unfortunately, we did, ha, ha, ha. Come on, it's a legal thing, gotta do it. All right, so let's take a look at Apple. That's the most important thing going on right now. Then we'll talk about oil, which is the second most important thing going on right now. Um, this is, we can check in on these guys, I think. No. Oh, no. Don't tell me you're doing a video one. Seen it live. Okay, apparently CNN's the one who does a live vlog. I want to, you know, instead of like, we're not going to listen to it. We're just going to sort of check in and see what they're saying. Okay, here we go. So let's see what's going on. There's Tim Cook running around. Wow, I'm getting a lot accomplished in a short amount of time. All right, Apple Watch. Okay, that's just all introductory stuff. Apple stores 500 million. So you get some numbers here that you have to really contemplate though. 500 million people a year visit the Apple stores. Um, they've shipped their 2 billionth iOS device. And somebody today on TV said there's about a billion that are currently in use. Um, and I was just pointing out today in the post that, um, you know, I mean, Apple's, Apple is now the 15th largest country on earth. That's what, that's what a trillion dollars is for GDP terms. Um, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's hard to contemplate how large this company has become and how, a billion. I mean, you have to look at it that way. And Facebook too. Look, Facebook is being used by by three billion people. Apple is being used by one billion people actively using an i an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad or something like that at any given time. A billion people. Uh, it's it's just truly amazing. And 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 it, you know, it took 
to bet against a company like that or sit there and try to say it's not going to do well, how could they not do well? Same goes for Facebook. How are they not going to do well if everybody's using them? They'll figure out a way to make some money. You don't have to, you only have to get a couple of pennies from everybody and you do quite well on the, on the bottom line. Um, this is what Cook's all excited about. See, millions of people have become an indispensable part of the daily life. These watches, by the way, are way more successful than you think. Um, a lot of people in, in, in third world countries and stuff go for these watches. Also, people, it's surprising the amount of people in this country have them. They hardly use them. They use them like a regular watch, but they like the fact that it's an Apple watch. I guess for the, you know, once in a while it beeps and tells you something important, like from your phone and makes you, I, I think I talked to some people and they said they like it because they, they can, women especially, they like it they can because they, they have the watch and it tells them if anything's actually happening that they should take their phone out of their purse, but they don't have to like check their phone anymore. But that's, you know, not, you know, for, for a lot of people, it's their whole thing. They, now it can be your whole computer. You don't need the, the, the iPhone anymore to go with it. So Apple Watch Series 4 seems to be the first thing they're uh, bringing out as far as coverage. So we'll check back on that and see if anything exciting happens while this goes on. So let's see. Now we can look at, we already, I'm going to make this thing small. All right. We already had some fun with the oil today. We made a quick $1,000 on a couple of contracts. Um, I, we stopped out when it went back over seventy fifty. Um, with RB, uh, I'm still in. I'm still because I still like it. I want to have a. I want to have more contracts when it keeps going up. So we'll let's wait and see where it goes. But I got one left right now. My average is two o three five, which is right here. And as you can see, down for the for the day, fifty bucks. So it's right. It's right about correct for where my average is. Um, we've cashed out silver, which hit fourteen thirty which is where it kept falling, so we may as well cash it out. And we cashed out the coffee because it was, two, it was up $2,000 in a couple of days. So, you know, may as well take that one off the table. So that's not bad. They've got 1000 here and 1200 here and 2000 here. That's like $4,200 uh, for the day. And uh, now we'll see what, what we can hit on gasoline and then short that. But, you know, no, notice these are, remember, now remember, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I lost like $20,000 on a stupid, uh, on the NASDAQ, which unfortunately had I kept it, it would have made a lot more than that because the NASDAQ went flying down afterwards. Um, but, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, right? But, look, the reason I got out of the trade is because I know I can make 4000 here and 3000 here and 2000 here and make that money up pretty quickly in a couple of weeks. The, the damage is that the net of the month of losing 20,000 and making 20,000, you know, making it back over the next month means I wasted it. I wasted a month. That's, that's what pisses me off. It's not the money. It's that the, it's the money I could have made had I not taken a big hit on the NASDAQ. But that's the difference between conviction selling, which is what got me into trouble and, um, and, and taking the quick stops because when I'm in trouble, I go back to, taking small positions with very quick stops because that's how you make money for sure. Now you make, I make money conviction do, selling too. I mean, I've made 20,000 on the NASDAQ. I made 50,000 on the NASDAQ, but the point is that's it's, a, it's as a discipline. Whenever I go, whenever I get behind, I'll, I go, it's like being a home run hitter. It's like, whenever I get behind, I go back to swinging for singles until I'm caught up. You know, like I don't want my average to go too far down. So I make it up by doing the stuff that you should be doing if you're a less experienced futures trader, which is just go for small wins. So we shorted oil, didn't work at 70. We shorted oil again, 70, 50. That didn't work. So, we, you know, let me take a $50 loss, $50 loss. But then it went to 71, 71 something. And I took another short below 71, and suddenly it worked. We made some nice money on a couple of contracts. Now it's coming back to 70. If it comes back to 71, I'm certainly going to short that again. And oil, I'm definitely going to short. Well, I'm going to add another a gasoline short if it comes up to 204. Uh, that would make my average 20. This is 2036. So my average would be 2038, which is. Um, Whoops, why are you not doing what you're supposed to do? Um, 
2038 is way up here. Oh no, I oh no, what I do? Oh, I cashed out. That was an accident. <laughs> I clicked on the button. All right, back to one short. <laughs> <laughs> While I was doing when I when I hit the when I was trying to scroll, I clicked on the button. <clears throat> All right, no harm there. So anyway, just taking quick shorts with quick exits, you know, quick profits, quick losses, <clears throat> and try to take the high percentage plays. That's how we make our money back when we're behind. And 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 frankly, again, like I said, I I usually do well with my conviction trades and, and sometimes I don't, but whenever I don't, I don't try to make my money up, my, my money back with another conviction trade because those can go, you know, if you lose two in a row, you can get in a pretty deep hole. I mean, I lost 20,000 on one. Um, so once I lose $20,000, I go back to zero by making tiny trades, which are very boring and tedious for me. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I like big trades. I like the big money. I like to make 20,000 bucks or 30,000 bucks, but you can't count on those. If sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Usually, I get them right, and I usually win. But when I don't get them right, I don't try another one right after that because then I could be down forty thousand bucks. And then if you go down three in a row, you're down sixty thousand bucks. So I don't want to do that. So I, I know I can make the money up with the small trading, which is the trading I teach you guys to do, because the small trading is, is much safer because you're picking a spot where there's some obvious resistance and then you're just betting it stays below that spot or above whatever whichever way you're trading like 7500 on the nasdaq would have been a good short if i had paid attention to it earlier um you want to pick a good line and then just play the, the dip until and you play it until it runs out people say well what what's your target my target is when it starts slowing down and you can see it slowing down look at the, look at the russell is a great example look at that so if you wish, you see the consolidation line here, right? And, and even to the point where today, this nice little helpful purple line is showing you where the middle is. So it goes below the middle, then it gets stuck trying to get over the middle. So you can short this line at 1718, set your stop at, set, it's almost 1719, in fact, 1718. But let's say you short at 1718.5, and then you get out at 1720, above 1720, you get out. So you lose 1.5, that's like $75. So you're risking $75. And you can see it's not getting over there. So you're in good shape. Then it starts heading down. And there's not any green. So that's not even a bounce until you get to right here. It's the first bounce. And it's a weak bounce. Then you don't get out. You wait, and it comes down lower. And now you wait, and it's a weak bounce, and you wait, and it's a weak bounce, and then once you hit the strong bounce line, you get out. So let's say you pick up 17, let's say it's 17 away. Let's say you take 10. 10 is 500 bucks on the Russell per contract. It's not hard to do that. You, you know, you can see when, when the game is over. Look, down, 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 and obviously something changed over here, and you stop out. But even so, you can just set that line and you're shorting 7,500, you assume 7,450 is going to be bouncy. And I, and I usually don't wait, frankly. When I see that, when I see a little bit of a bounce coming up and I see it slowing down, not going anymore, and I know that's going to be support anyway, I take the money. I'm not going to wait. Why should I wait and watch it? That takes my time. So I'm not going to waste my time watching it. I know 1,750 is going to be bouncy. I know I just made on the NASDAQ that's a thousand I make a thousand contract off the table and say thank you very much. You, you don't you don't have to go for huge wins. It's so easy to make. It's so easy to make two hundred and fifty, five hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. That comes all the time. So why try to make thousands when you can just make a thousand and leave and make a thousand and leave and make a thousand and leave? You don't have to wait for one big one. It's like fishing. It's like fishing except. You're allowed to keep a little fish right <laughs> you know how annoying it is when you, when you go if you go fishing and you have to throw back the little fish it's like the only thing you caught all day was little fish and you just keep throwing them back you don't have to throw back little wins though you can keep the little wins nobody stay nobody makes you throw them back and those little wins add up to big wins unlike fishing you can't you can't take home a bucket of little fish and go look how good i did <laughs> you need that one big one all right any questions 
Phil, my stupid question of the week by three. Fantastic. Trading futures increases my my BP. Um, I guess you mean your buy, it decreases your buying power, I think. And chances of making mistakes. How about options on futures? I don't like it's too they're too violent. I mean, I don't like them. They're not that they're it's, it's a whole different thing. And um and, and cost wise, it's so much cheaper to just trade the future. And I'm not really sure how you have less of a less of a buying. I think you're saying decreases your buying power. I don't see why it would be a better for your buying power if you start buying option contracts on futures. Buy and set sell order and not look at it. No, no, no. Because well, first of all, again, it's going to move very violently on you those futures. Um, the the options on the futures are, are very heavy contracts. Also. Um, the stopping out, it needs to be done quickly and out and you reset. And if you keep doing that with options, you're always going to pay the spread of the option. So in other words, if I go to like SPX here, oops, SPX, no, no, can I do ES? What's it going to show me? <laughs> okay so if i go to, to es and i look at december and here are the options right and we're always we're at um 28.88 so let's say i want to short Twenty-eight. So short twenty-eight eighty. First of all, that's sixty-six dollars. So if I want to, if I want to buy that contract, and we'll do one contract. Whoops, came to zero. Do one contract. That's going to take up um, three thousand buying power versus four thousand dollars for a futures trade and if i now you might want to go to um let's say you're doing a short-term one we'll go to october i would want to do september i think that's crazy um you can say you go to october and we look at the same things the things in the way and i can't do it Oh, here you go. And these are very thinly traded also. Um, see these spreads? You see 25 and 75? That's 50 cents you're going to lose on the spread going in and out of the contract for one thing. So that's already... A horrific ripoff. There's still 28 bucks. So if I buy that put, what are they going to charge me? $1,600. So it's a little bit better for buying power. But frankly, look, if you don't have a lot of buying power, you shouldn't be messing around with the futures in the first place. It, this is not a game. I mean, these things are incredibly violent. You should play if you want to play SPY or something like that. Play that, but don't go jumping on futures contracts because they will move very quickly against you. And and, and you 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 know if you say I'm going to get stopped out, so what's the benefit? You know you say you get stopped out and lose a bunch of money. they and they're not cheap. So where are we? Silver's back to fourteen thirty. Gasoline's up. Nobody's hitting my goals yet. So we'll see what happens. Shut that down for a minute. But I'm I'm not a fan. Oh, it increases your blood pressure. There, your buying power. <laughs> so the question was actually trading futures increase my blood pressure. Don't trade them then. Oh, for God's sakes, don't trade anything where you're sitting there worrying about it. You shouldn't be doing those kind of trades. If you if you worry about stuff like that, trade the butterfly portfolio, which is I you don't even talk about it. 
here. Let's see. Let's see how the butterfly portfolio is doing. I actually probably need. I didn't. I don't think I finished an update on it, but somewhere there's a butterfly portfolio. Where is that thing? Is it this? There it is. Let's see. It's a long term portfolio. Butterfly. Okay, so here's the butterfly portfolio. Um, it definitely needs to update because we, we still have these model delays that need to be canceled out. So it's making it look less. Easy. But even even with that, we should have more profit than we do. 34.4%. And we don't touch this thing. <laughs> and the uh, money tour portfolio is another one. Ah, this comment box is in my way. You guys can't see it. But. And the money tour portfolio, we only, we only touch it once a quarter. And we started it one year ago. It says it's one year anniversary. 71% it's up in a year. We only change it once a quarter, and we're constrained in that we can't even change it when we want to. We change it um, for um, when I'm on the TV show, on Money Talk. So if I'm not on the TV show, I can't make a change, no matter how good of an idea it might be to make a change. So without touching these trades, they're up 71%. Why would you mess around with futures if they bother you? Futures are for fun. Futures are gambling. It's like like when I play poker, I play poker because I, I, I play poker like a business, like I win at poker. And I like playing poker and I enjoy it. But sometimes I want to get up and I'm bored and I stretch my legs and then I play some craps. But I'm not playing craps because I think I'm going to win at craps. I'm playing craps because I have fun playing craps. And the futures is the same. I have fun playing futures, but I make my money playing, playing these long-term positions. This is how you make money. Very sensible entries where you're selling premium to people. Let other people have high blood pressure. Let other people worry about stuff. You sell premium to those suckers because they're going to panic out of their positions and they're going to sell and they're going to and you're going to make the money off the bid ass spread and you're going to make money off of their um, off of the premium burn that they get. So Brian says, how do you, yes, we start from scratch with a new portfolio like the butterfly or the LTP. Well, we add positions all the time, Brian. So when we add them, you can add new ones. And when we, and when we look at, and when we adjust positions also, um, uh, for, frankly, by definition, every position in the butterfly portfolio is, can be done right now because um, essentially uh, the butterfly portfolio is all about selling front month premiums against long positions. Uh, oh, this is not, I was just going to say, those are weird butterfly, <laughs> those are weird butterfly positions. Well, the butterfly positions, those, see, I can see by looking at them, they're not butterfly plays. Um, so the whole point of the butterfly portfolio is to have these long positions, like here we have the OIH um, 2030 bull call spread with the 20, oh, that's all we have is a bull call spread for whatever reason we never sell the puts. Um, so we have the 2030 bull call spread, and we sold the October 25 puts and calls for. Now, notice this bull call spread. All right, we're not worried. In the case of OIH, we're not worried about OIH going lower. We think it, it, it's very fairly valued. So we think that's a good range. So we play the 2030 bull call spread. We're not worried about it going lower, so we're not worried about the short puts being covered. We're only covering the long calls with this spread, and we're actually being aggressive on the spread because we have – only two thirds coverage here. So we spent net $5,000 on this spread roughly. And in, in, in well, not in one month, yeah, in one, I'm sorry, in uh, three months, in, in one quarter, we collected $1,500 of premium. So we spent $5,000 on the spread and that was back in um, April, I'm sorry, April, in February, in February we started the spread. So in, in February, we spent $5,000, and we probably collected May, and this is probably our second sale. So we're collecting $3,000 in premium in the first couple, in the first um, 
seven months. And we'll probably collect another, uh, let's say, four more. So let's say we'll collect six more thousand dollars of premium. That'll be nine thousand dollars of premium collected against a five thousand dollars position. So we're going to make all the money. Now, it's not just we're going to make all the money on the position. We're going to make all the five thousand dollars back plus four thousand in profit selling premium. So that's eighty percent profit, right? For uh, four into five is eight. Is 80 percent um plus though whatever value remains on that bull call spread is also profit for us so let's say we finish up at 25 dollars we're still going to make 15 times 25 is another seven thousand five hundred dollars doing nothing all we do is pick the target where we think that oih is going to finish each quarter and we buy, and we sell the puts and calls there and, and at the moment, we're pretty much on the money because we're at 2430 and we bet it would finish at 25 in October. And if it goes higher, we don't really care because we only sold five. We only, and we're only and, and yeah, and we're only doing a one third sale. We, we're not even confident in this position. Mondelez, here's the Mondelez. Again, we're not worried about it going down. We have the 40, 47 bull call spread. We sold the $40 puts. And then to make money, we sell the 42 puts and calls. And they're at 43.22 right now. These guys expired pretty close to worthless. Um, in July, we sold the August calls. We collected $1,200. Now, if we collect $1,200 a month, this thing's going to be a monster because we only spent um, 10 minus uh, 6, 7 is about $3,000. So let's say $4,000 that we spent on the long. And we're selling twelve hundred dollars a month against it. Just do the math. We have eight, we have sixteen months to sell. So sixteen times twelve hundred dollars is, I don't know, eighteen thousand dollars or something like that, and um, or more than eight, nineteen something. Um, so, so let's say we're gonna we're gonna sell nineteen thousand dollars worth of premium against a a four thousand dollar position. I don't know. I mean, I, look, I don't want to say how can you lose because it sounds too easy. It's not that easy because in reality, what if there's a violent move? What if something weird happens to Monterey? You can lose these positions because if you get if it if it violently moves out of the channel, then you're going to take a hit on the on the puts or calls that you sold in the channel. Now we're in this case we're 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 betting the Mondelez is very unlikely to have a, a bad event that takes it down, and we're heavily covered though we're doing a very light sale here we we have twenty longs, so we'll collect um, twenty times seven dollars which is um, fourteen thousand dollars we'll get back if it busts up in the channel, and we and we have five five short calls at risk at forty two. So let's say it goes to 47 and these are worth five bucks each. That's only 2,500 bucks. If it goes to $10, it's $5,000. It's almost, it's really hard for this thing to hurt us. But we are gonna grind out every month and sell more and more puts and calls. So, um, so these guys expired worthless. I never updated this portfolio. So I have to do, I have to do a lot of updating work next week. Um, and we, I'm sure we sold something. I don't know what it is yet. Um, but even even not knowing it doesn't really matter because you can go to Mondelez and I say to myself, well, OK, where's Mondelez? I, I think they're pretty fairly priced. And between now and October, I don't see much happening. So I think I probably sell the 43 puts and calls. And here I can get a dollar for the for the calls and I can get 80 cents here. So it's another buck 80 times five is um, nine hundred dollars. So I'm going to collect another nine hundred dollars for this month. And, and on the whole, Mondelez doesn't do much. Um, hang on, I've got my chart somewhere. Where are these things? What is that? Oh, I'm giving you that. Stock charts. So, gallery view. So 
So look, all we're doing is we're assuming they're gonna keep drifting around in this channel here. If they break out of the channel, we'll have to make an adjustment. But you know what? We sell puts and calls. Can't both lose, only one can lose, right? We sold the $43 puts and calls, only one can lose. And um, and that's all it is. We just set the target and put it up. Uh, what else? Look, I mean, look at this thing over years. Here's three years. They went to 37, they went to 44. Here's the channel, though, right at 42. So sometimes they'll go up and sometimes they'll go down, but as long as you just keep selling, and keep being patient anytime it hits the middle you win so anytime it closes in the middle you win on both sides and when it doesn't close in the middle you roll and you roll and you roll and you roll and the first time it closes below where you roll to you win so all that happens when you don't win is you have to wait and this these months you don't make your hundred bucks or your thousand bucks so you know, one, two, three, four months, you don't make a thousand bucks, but you made it on the put side. Okay. And then you win. And then for one, two, three months, you don't make it on the put side, but then you win. And then you, but you make it on the call side. So you make it, so in other words, you make a thousand, a thousand, a thousand when it closes around here. Then you make 500, 500, 500, because you only made the put money, not the call money. Then you make 500, 500, 500. No, I'm sorry. Then you make thousand, thousand, thousand. Then you make, not the then you're making losing on the call side but winning on the on i'm sorry losing on the put side winning on the call side so 500 500 500 then it's a thousand a thousand a thousand 500 500 a thousand a thousand a thousand back to 500s and then back to thousands so that's all it is um now during this period when it's way up or way down you'll be showing i'm um, now I'm saying what you're net gaining after you do your rolling. You do your rolling and you wait for it to do this. So you, you're not taking this loss. Although on paper, you're going to show a pretty good loss when this is happening. Your short calls here are going to show a big loss. Your short puts here are going to show a big loss. But if you keep rolling them, you don't have to take that loss. It's just on paper. And, and and overall, the butterfly portfolio, look at the buying power, it's still 40. And this is, this is by the way, um, like IRA buying power, where every every dime is taken out, where you have no, you have no margin at all. So with no margin at all, you still have only, you still have almost half your buying power sitting here on this portfolio. So it's not even margin intensive trading like this. So, you know, if you're worried about, you know, you should never worry about your blood pressure. If It's just not a thing you should be doing. Just don't make those kind of trades that bother you. And, and as far as setting up a portfolio, you know, I cannot say enough how much, how, how much the butterfly portfolio is my favorite portfolio as far as being safe and being consistent. It makes 20 to 40% pretty much all the time. I, I cannot remember... I know, I know, I remember it was down at some point, but I can't remember it ever being seriously down. I mean, I think when we had the big crash, it was down a bit, but not even much because we just stopped playing it. It wasn't working. So we said, okay, we'll take a rest. And we lost a bit of money and we then we just waited until the conditions were getting better again. Um, but you can play it bullish and you can play it bearish and you can adjust it. But the bottom line is, as far as trades go, it's the simplest concept in the world. You're taking a position, not to win or lose, I could really care less what Mondelez does over the course of a couple of years. Uh, you know, it's a nice bonus when it does well and it hits our targets, but all I care about is finding something that trades in a channel that I can play. And then I can sell puts and calls. So what am I doing? I'm opening up a store. Or, or as we say, we're opening up our casino game, right? We're inviting bettors to bet with us. So I now to do that, I have to invest. I have to take a position in a stock that I want to sell puts and calls against. So I look for a stock that is short term volatile, but long term flat, like um, let's say at t is a good example. at t is a very good example because we made those those uh, drawing videos, right, to, to, for the examples. We made them like five years ago. And at t is one of the examples we use in how to how to be in the be the house video. And it was at 30 something dollars in. So going way back here, it was still at 30 something dollars. And it's always at 30 something dollars. That's where it lives. 
but that's the best stock in the world then. So, uh, you know, you want to sell. See these swings? These swings are what give you a good price to sell options on. And so you sell that option, you sell the short-term volatility while your position is just rock steady over time. So you don't go into it looking to make money. I mean, you don't go into it saying, I expect T to be up and down. I, all I want to do is protect the positions I'm going to be selling. So in T's case, and again, this was another one where I would say that um, I don't believe at t is going to be below 20, 25. I don't see that. I don't think it would be below 28. So I will happily sell the $30 puts for two bucks. So in other words, I'm not worried about protecting short puts and I'm going to be aggressively, effectively, aggressively long. So I'll sell these puts for two bucks. I'll buy this one for six bucks, the 28 calls, and I'll sell the 33 calls for, mm, no, nah, let's sell the 35s. All right, so let's say we sell the 35s for, for 190 or 185 or whatever. So 185, and this is six, we said we're gonna sell these for six. So we have the 28, 35 bull call spread. So we have a $7 spread, that's pretty wide. So the 28, $35 spread, it's certainly not out of reach because we're at 33 now. And we're paying for this spread, we're spending four dollars or a little bit of four fifteen, let's say. Then we're gonna subtract another two for the put. So now we're spending um what I say, two fifteen. So now we're spending two dollars and fifteen cents total on a seven dollar spread. So we have five dollars of upside cushion. But more importantly, I can buy ten contracts for two thousand dollars, ten spreads for two thousand dollars net. I'm obligated to, to on the put side with 30 short puts. And here you go, 30 short puts. We'll do a thing. We'll sell single, uh, da, 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 10. Okay, so we sell 10 puts. And the buying power effect is 2,500 bucks. So it's 2,500 in buying power. So that's, that's your margin on this side. Um, another 2,000 in cash. So that's... That's basically two, so 2,000 cash, 2,000 buying power is being used on the spread. Now, why did I do that? What can I do with it? Well, I don't think, I don't see why AT&T would really be up or down much in the next month. So we could sell, let's sell five, not even all, we're not going to fully cover. We're just going to sell five of the $33 calls for 85 cents and the $33 puts for 60, let's call it 65 to be easier to math. So that's, um, a dollar fifty. So now we're collecting seven hundred and fifty dollars by selling the thirty-three calls and the thirty-three puts against our two thousand dollar long position, and that's for thirty-seven days. And we have five hundred days to sell. So roughly fifteen times we'll be able to collect that money. So if we're collecting eight hundred and fifty dollars, is that what I said? There's a dollar fifty times five, seven fifty. Sorry, if we're collecting seven hundred and fifty dollars. Hang on. No calculator. There you go. That's way over here. There we go. All right. So if we collect seven hundred and fifty dollars fifteen times. That's $11,250 we're collecting against our $2,000 long position. Now, we're not always going to win. Sometimes at t will be up. Sometimes it'll be down, like I said before. But we're what one of our sides is always going to win. And as long as we finish reasonably in the range that we set, so we'll divide that by two. And we've collected $5,600. So in other words, even if we only collect half the money, most of the time when we sell these puts and calls remember what i said you're going to sell the puts and the calls and you're going to when it goes up you're losing on the on the calls but you're winning on the puts obviously so you're collecting half the money but then you're rolling you're not taking the loss you're rolling the loss on the on the short calls and when it finally goes down now you now that zeroes out all the all the losses zero out here 
and now you go back to making money. But if it takes a, a drastic drop, which at t does tend to do, um, it's actually kind of a ripoff um, as far as the um, the short call money because it's more volatile than, than what they're paying you for. That's in fact that's why if you wonder why it isn't in the butterfly portfolio, that's why because it is it's more volatile than they're paying you for. You're you're not getting paid enough to take the risk of the stock moving. But nonetheless, the point is, I was just trying to make an example of it. Uh, the point is that over the long haul, you're still going to make two and a half times what you laid out, plus the bonus of anything. We took the 28 calls and sold the 35 calls. And if it ends up in the money, that's a bonus 7,000 bucks. It's like a freaking money printing machine. And you know what? That's what a casino is, right? And that's why the, that's why the whole point of what we try to teach you guys is being the house. Is run your own casino game. Don't play the game. Don't gamble. Why should you gamble when you can do this? This is not gambling. This is statistics. And you might get burned just like a casino. You can lose money. One guy can walk away a big winner and you can get burned on, on a, in a casino. But as long as you have a lot of games going on, as long as you spread your risk, and have lots of games going on, then statistically it becomes less and less likely that you're going to take a significant hit. And that's what we do in our portfolios. We set up a wide, diverse amount of positions that allow us to, um, to spread the risk. So essentially, that's our whole thing. That's what we do. And, you, and to say, you know, it's not that hard. You can pick this up at any time. We announce new positions constantly. We're constantly adding to our portfolio. Every day we have new positions. Every month we have new, new, you know, every month we certainly add a few positions to each portfolio every month. But every day we have trade ideas. It's never, almost never a day goes by where we don't have new trade ideas. And you can always say, is that a good one to put in this portfolio? Or I'm looking to fill out this portfolio. You know, but what are the rules? The rules are be diversified. Don't. Put too much money in tech. Don't put too much in banking. Don't put too much in consumers. Spread the risk around. Kramer says that all the time. So the only smart thing Kramer ever tells people. Be diversified. We're not here to take the risk. We're here to make the money. It's two different games going on in the market. And most people, unfortunately, are the ones taking the risk. Oh, look at the Dow falling apart. Wow. Um, Oh, Arby's up to 204. Thank you. All right. Yes. For me, it's double down. Let me see. Um, and to trader. Where are we? Yes. Oh, yes. That's what I was waiting for. Where is it? There it is. All right. Now, these are very sloppy because I should have been watching. You know, if I was playing properly, I would have been watching it earlier. So now I have two, and my average is 20367. And it's and it's at 20387. So now we'll see what happens, but hopefully it stays below. Uh, oil is not confirming this move in gasoline, so it's two different things. And meanwhile, gasoline had a huge build. I don't know what the hell they're doing. Oil had a drawer, gasoline had a build. So I these guys are really off the rails. Well, we should look at that report. We, we'll take a look at the report later. Um, I wanted to get back to the Apple thing. Anyway, but there you go. So I just added one. It raised my basis a bit. When it gets back down to, to where I am, I'm going to get back to even, and I'll have one with a higher basis. That's that's basically the game plan. Um, Apple event, Apple event. Where was that thing? What did I do with it? I lost the Apple event. Is this it? Oh, it's here. All right, so what's going on? Oh, wow, look how much I've been blabbing. Let's see what's going on in Apple land. The Apple Watch can detect the fall. Oh, my God. I wonder if I can get that for my mom. Can I get her to wear it? Because she won't wear the other thing. She will not wear that I fall and I can't get it up bracelet. She thinks she makes it look old. But the watch is interesting. The question is, what does it do when you fall? Um... The speaker is 50. All right, this is all about the watch, which I, frankly, I'm not a big, I, I don't care. I, the watch is going to be a huge item. People don't realize how big it's going to be. I said that before. But um, they just keep making it better and better and better, basically.
Okay, we learned that with falls, there's a repeatable motion that happens when you fall your arms pitch forward and brace yourself as a natural upward motion in the arms to demonstrate that. That's so cool. Uh, it is amazing. I mean, thank God somebody does research and development. Fall detected calling emergency services. Holy crap. If the watch senses you're immobile for one minute, it'll contact emergency services. Full detection is a feature we hope you never need. Optical heart centers. Oh, geez. This is crazy. Oh, see, here you go. If you're worried about your blood pressure, you can wear an Apple watch. So why is the Dow doing so badly? So is Apple down? Um, do, 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 do. Heart, heart, heart. Electrocardiogram. What? Built-in EKG. No other over-the-counter EKG product. Wow. Yeah, there's apparently something you can wear that goes with your Apple Watch that can give you like a total readout of your heart. That's kind of cool. Look, here's the president of something. <laughs> All right. Da, 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 da. It's a health device. FDA. They're very pleased with this thing, whatever it is. Okay. Oh, no, that's scary. Hold your finger on the crown. When you open the app, you see this. 18-hour battery life on the watch. That is so cool. Wow. I mean, I... <laughs> I used to remember that they, I'm I'm just exactly old enough where that I've lived the history of computers and and the the stuff that this thing can do in this size is just amazing. So it's got a two times faster louder speaker, fall detection, heart sensor, EKG app, larger design. So cool. Oh wow! Look at that series from oh series three from two seventy nine. I don't tell you what the series four is. Oh wait, three ninety nine. Oh no, it starts at three ninety nine. Oh, with cellular four ninety nine. So there you go. Basically, it's an iPhone with cellular. So you don't need an iPhone, just your watch, and you can make phone calls and stuff with your watch. Isn't that crazy? So five hundred bucks. You know, and and again, I, I mean, I'm just thinking like <laughs> five hundred bucks. I remember spending three thousand dollars for my. Um, Apple II C, you know, with the print, it was with the printer and the monitor. But I remember, I remember what it was. I was a kid, and it was like so freaking expensive. It's the most expensive thing I ever bought: the Apple II C with a green screen monitor and a dot matrix printer, and it was for the incredibly low price of three thousand dollars as a bundle. <laughs> and I paid it off, and I paid three hundred dollars a month for a year, basically, to, to pay it off. Um, it was, it was a shitload of money. It was so much money. But I was like, I got to have this thing. <laughs> okay, watches, watches, watches. Delivery. Oh, my daughter's going to be so happy. She doesn't want the watch. She wants the computer. So September 14th. Oh, look at those bands are getting really nice, too. Wow. That's amazing. Doesn't take pictures, though, does it? I don't think watch takes pictures. That's that's something we got to work on. Now we're going to talk about iPhones. This is what I care about. Oh, I'm I'm super happy with my iPhone X. Yep, see, ninety eight percent customer satisfied. I really like. I mean, I really like. Really like it. It's a really incredible device. Da 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 da. Big X. Blah blah blah. So how much bigger iPhone XS. All right, I'm not here to figure out how much, what these things are. Here you go. Here's the one my daughter wants. Wait, is that the one? 5.8? No, no. Whatever the biggest one is, my daughter wants. HDR movies. OLED. Oh, still OLED. Wow. Okay. I don't really. Ah, sit that. Wait, 6.5 inch. Two sizes. That's, that's the one. 6.5 inches is a really big phone. It's not OLED, it's Super Retina. Ah, interesting. I'm pretty sure that's what that means. Oh, no, it is OLED. Oh, okay. So it's the Super Retina OLED is what they're saying. Biggest display ever on, a, on an iPhone. 
the XS Max. And it's incredible. <laughs> okay, 3D touch. See, they said they weren't going to have that anymore. Yeah. Oh, here you go. 120 touch sensing, tap to weight, true tone display. Where's the... Oh, it's just that picture. You can't see the, the cameras. Um, color management. Ugh. OLED display. A million contrast. HDR. Dolby, Dolby Vision. <laughs> Things you didn't even know you wanted. Look at this crap. Wow. Okay. Um, most secure facial. Look, I got uh, that facial stuff does work. One, you know, once you get used to it, by the way, the facial recognition, it's actually very convenient. It's just you have to just you have to just think about the fact that it has to see you. So but but to let it see you, like, you know, sometimes you like peek your head at it or something like that just so it can see you. Because I, people I know who use the sensor get frustrated that it doesn't unlock when they think it should. But it only unlocks when it can see you. So if it can't see you, it can't unlock. So, you, you know, don't have silly expectations of what it can do. But once you get used to it, you start realizing all I got to do is tilt the phone in my direction. It can turn itself on. And, and it doesn't have to be turned on. It doesn't have to see you to, to answer a call or anything like that. 50% um, faster, you bastards. Ugh, I don't, I don't want to get a new one yet. <laughs> I have to get a new one if it's 50% faster, though. Jeez. 40% lower power? Are you kidding me? Five trillion? I don't care what it is. I want five trillion. Jesus. <laughs> wow. You guys are crazy. All right. What else is going on? Ah, oh, better Siri. Blah, blah, blah. Super duper cameras. Augmented reality. I can't even deal with that. It's just beyond my... My, what I understand, beyond my understanding. Oh, look, shit. And they're showing you the, how you do these games. Oh, and that's where we're up to. So they're showing you some games now. All right. So looking good at Apple land. I don't understand why the Dow is down so much. Is Apple down? Let's see. Oh, they are down a bit. Wow, why? Yeah, people are crazy, man. <laughs> gonna, they're going to make a fortune. So I'm not sure why the Dow is down. Let's see. Quick look at the news. Mm. Fitbit down. Oh, Fitbit's down because of the Apple Watch. Oh, that would have been an obvious trade. I didn't even think of that. What the hell do you need a Fitbit for? Poor Fitbit. Why would you want a Fitbit? It only does that one thing, and it doesn't cost that much less. Um, Eurozone, oh, here you go. That's why we started tra trading down. Eurozone production dropped in July for a second month by 0.8%, more than expected, signaling possible slowdown. Germany and Italy recorded 1.8% monthly drop. Oh, wow, that's nasty. Okay, so that, those are bad numbers. Jenny Craig is looking for a buyer because Oprah's kicking her ass with, new, with uh, Weight Watchers. Boeing comes back a bit. Here's a bunch of stuff on Apple. They're only saying what they know, I think. 5.8 Super Retina, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they're just saying the same stuff we just read, so we're not going to get into that. So that's it. That's the yes. The only thing that happened is the European numbers came out that were really bad. So that's what caused that little sell-off, and that's definitely going to affect uh, oil prices. So RB double down. We discussed RB V8. I don't know what RB we're. In. So what, I'm just using front mount contract at the moment. Oh yay! Look, see it's coming back. Okay, that's good. <laughs> So, you know, I'm not dying to take this off or anything like that, but I, I strongly believe it will be back at 2 bucks or 196 again, and that's some really big money on gasoline. 
So I'm kind of happy to hold two contracts open. But if I make the quick money and if it has a quick dip and I can get back, I'm, it's kind of silly not to. Plus, I want to demonstrate to you why you want to do this. Yeah, I am teaching. Um, RB is going up because they're anticipating supply disruptions from the hurricane. That doesn't make any sense because there's, <clears throat> there's not going to really hit the refineries. And um, and more importantly, though, you've got to, the, the real disruption is in demand because if nobody's going to drive, nobody in the East Coast is going to drive for two days with a huge, massive storm. And it's going to affect a lot of stuff. And also, it's going to ground trucks. Like, they, this is the biggest thing is because the trucks can't go up and down. It, it doesn't matter that the truck can drive around in Georgia or the truck can drive around in New York. It has to go from Georgia to New York. So if the middle is, is impassable, and, and so un, it's unrealistic. The truckers don't say, oh, I'm going to try to bullet it through. They don't do that. They wait. They just have to wait the storm out. So when they have to wait the storm out, it's a huge disruption of the demand for uh, for um, diesel fuel. So there's a lot of reasons that, that, that it's not a good bet to bet positive on gasoline for something like that. If it's hitting Texas and you hit the refineries, that's different. But this isn't hitting any big refineries that we have to worry about right now. Um, Alistair says, um, I just got the Series 3 Wi-Fi cell watch a couple of weeks ago. It's amazing. Answer, make a call on it. So much more. Totally track self and exercise. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm just blown away by the technology in these things. It's amazing. Randy says, how's my college girl doing? How is she doing being away from home? <laughs> she is having the time of her life. She could not be happier. Um, <laughs> I went up to see her Friday night, but I got there at 7. She was already into her evening, so she didn't have time for me. Um, which I honestly, it's weird because it makes me happy because it's like there's nothing that I want more out of life than to raise strong, independent children. That's like been always my goal in life is to raise kids that are, that that can deal with stuff. And I've always taught them to like be adaptive and and be able to go out and do things like this. And she is thriving over there. I'm so freaking happy. She has made friends, and she's got groups, and she's trying different activities, and she's testing stuff out. And she's only been like a week <laughs> or two weeks. I guess it's two weeks now. Um, but she's she's having way too much fun. Like she, and it's funny because like going up, she was nervous driving up to college. Like she said she'd be miserable, and and she's just been a complete happy surprise for her. So it's a good fit. I'm very happy, and uh, she she's thrilled. She's having a good time, and hopefully it continues. Um, she was happy that she's happy she could do her dorm the way she wanted her, her, you know, she's an artist. Her, her dorm room is already like an art project. Um, <laughs> and she did so much stuff and, um, uh, it's a good experience for her. So I mean, God bless. So we'll see. Um, I mean, I, it's funny cause I never put that much thought into college. Like for me, it was like going to college was just. I just packed my bags, threw my stuff in the car, drove up to college, and I was like, okay, I'm in college now. Um, I never really thought of it as, as the way she did. She put so much thought into her experience and what was going to happen. And it's all, all entwined with, like, her, she was just so concerned about making friends and doing stuff. I didn't think twice about it. I guess probably, though, because my daughter, uh, she, she lives in the same house she was born in. And I didn't. I, I moved. Oof. I must have moved seven times. Moved, they lived in seven different places when I was young. My parents moved a lot. Uh, you know, my folks got divorced, and then my mother and my stepfather moved a bunch of times, getting different houses and stuff. Um, so for me, I you know, college, I, I never it didn't occur to me that I'd have trouble making friends because I always made friends. I always went to new schools and made friends, so it was a pretty normal part of my life. Um, for her, I could understand the difference because she kind of, you know, was she never had to make friends. She's never been outside. You know, she always lived with the people she grew up with. And our, our town is very small and the school that she goes to is small. Um, so I guess that's a little weird. And uh, it's good for Jackie, too. Jackie's my younger daughter. She's got another two, year, two years to go to college. And... Um, She's she was very it's good for her to see Maddie happy because because Maddie Jackie's got way more friends than Maddie did in in school and um and then you know Maddie's the kind of person that's a couple of close 
you know, intense friendships, whereas Jackie has like 200 people come to her parties, um, that kind of thing. So uh, it makes Jackie happy because she's looking at it and saying, oh, I could do this. You know, if Maddie, if Maddie could do it, I could certainly do it. So I think Jackie's a lot more enthusiastic. In fact, Jackie's so enthusiastic at college. She's kind of she's bitching about um, having to go back to high school. <laughs> so, was, so I'd say it was a successful weekend trip. Anyhow, so what else is going on? Uh, let me look at the other chart. Hang on, let me move some stuff around here. Charts. There we go. So. Well, that's nasty, huh? Anyway, well, I said we're not going to hold 26,000. We're not. Um, 70, oh, again, that 7,500 bet, doing well. All right, so nothing exciting there. Oil is still pretty high. Gasoline, very high. Natural gas. Food. Now, natural gas is the thing that should be going up because you, you may get disruption in the Gulf. That's when you really want to play natural gas. When you get that, that the storm that disrupts the Gulf of Mexico, this storm would have to cross over to the Gulf. It's not likely to happen, but there are a bunch of storms backing this up. Yeah, by the way, there's like a conga line of storms behind this one. There's a lot of hurricanes coming. So we could have a lot of little problems here. <clears throat> Here's Brent. As I said this morning, Brent's going to get rejected off of 80. That was that was the ideal place to play oil short because because 80 is a very tough nut for Brent to crack. And coffee, where I mean, as I said, we got out of coffee. We made some, you know, got to, got back to its highs. So we said get out of that, and uh, we'll see what happens on that. I'm not dying to re-enter. Silver is back where I left it, so I'm not worried about, about that. The dollar, you can actually play the dollar up from here. The dollar took a hell of a beating. And I don't think this was very realistic. So you got a big drop here, like almost five, like half a point drop. And not for a good reason. So I think that might be a nice play. But my favorite play is going to be this gasoline short because it's 420 a penny. So if we drop five pennies back to 198, that's going to be $2,000 per contract. So, you know, the way I look at it is your potential gain is 2000 bucks. Your potential loss is you're going to stop out with not even a $200 loss. So that's what you call a good risk reward. And by the way, it's another key thing to this whole being the house strategy. What is your risk versus what's your reward? And don't make plays that have a higher, a higher risk than reward. I don't really like to get into anything where the reward isn't double the risk. Because if you're getting paid twice as much when you win as when you lose, then you only have to be right one third of the time to be even. And that means if you can just manage to be 40% right, you're going to come out well ahead. If you can be 50% right, you're going to come out way ahead. And if you're 60 and 70% right, like we have, like we are in our um, top trades usually, you, you know, you make a fortune. And that's how it works. But it's all about percentages, and that's why I don't like to chase things. You guys ask me all the time. Everybody's saying, oh, what about this? What about that? I don't like to go after stocks that have already taken huge gains. I like the stocks that haven't made a gain yet. And, yes, yeah, sometimes they go lower. But I, I much prefer to pick up a bargain stock that I can that I can hang on to for the long term than take some momentum stock that that's up, you know, some momentum stock that's here and say, oh, I hope, you know, let's say it's 202. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. And, you know, so say take something at 202 and hope it goes to 204, which this did. But sometimes you can take it at 202 and it goes down to, and it goes down to 195. And that's and, and what are you going to do? Is it ever going to recover? You don't know because you have no value floor. Like Netflix doesn't have a value floor. Amazon doesn't have a value floor. They're trading at hundreds of times their earnings. There's no, there's no place where you can put your foot down and say, well, God damn it, I would buy this company for that. If I had a trillion dollars, I'd buy Amazon tomorrow. If you can't say that, then you shouldn't be buying it. Now, if you gave me a trillion dollars tomorrow and said, what would you want to do with it? I'd say, well, could I buy Apple? I'll buy freaking Apple for a trillion dollars because it makes 50-something billion a year. 
it makes in 20 years it'll make a trillion dollars for me and i'll still have the company that's freaking uh five percent back on your money you know how hard it is to earn five percent on a trillion dollars you have to like do a lot of stuff or i can so in other words, i could take a trillion dollars and i could buy hundreds and hundreds of companies and 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 hope they all do well and jiggle and juggle when they have a crash or something like that or i could just buy apple and make five percent a year on my trillion dollars every year i get 55 50 billion dollars in the bank and i pocket that i could live off 50 billion a year i mean i i could sleep by so, so what better use do I have of a trillion dollars other than buying an Apple computer? That's what it comes down to. I used to do M&A. And I would always, I would always tell my clients this, because they're always saying, oh, should we buy this? What do you think of that? What do you think of that? And I'm always like, well, what, do you, what else would you do with the money? Say, so forget your business, forget everything else. What else would you do with the money? And if you, if you can't think of anything better to do, then the thing you want to do, then that's probably a good idea. But if you can think of something better to do, and I, I'm saying no limits, I'm saying, you know, this whatever you can think of in the world, buy, you know, like, you, you know, it doesn't matter to your IBM and, and I say you can buy gold. And IBM is like, we can't buy gold or IBM. You know, it's like, of course not. But, but you have to think of like, are there better things to do with your money than the thing you're thinking of doing? Should you buy this small company for $2 billion or should you take $2 billion and, and invest in a pot business? And then you have to say, well, for, and again, they go back, I have IBM, I need, I need to invest in the electronics company. That's a factor, but you have to say to yourself, well, how much more money would you make investing in the pot business than you'll make in this company? And if you were going to make 10 times more money investing in the pot business in that company, why don't you just hold on to the money and wait? Because maybe there'll be a better opportunity somewhere else. But you shouldn't be able to make that much more money doing something else than the thing you're investing in. There are other factors, but the biggest, a biggest factor has to be, is this the best use of my money that I'm deploying? And, and, and people say this all the time about portfolios also, because, you know, you know, like we, we just bought a, uh, the, our, our, PSW Investments, our investment company. We just bought a pot company. That's why it's on my mind. And um, we just bought 25% of a pot company, actually, not 27.5%. Not um, so we invested in a pot company that we're going to uh, move forward and we're, we're expanding them and so on and so forth. Um, and there wasn't a better use of a million dollars that we had to invest in this company. We, you know, we looked at it six ways to Sunday we said yeah, open now I, I have other businesses that we're looking at we looked at we were talking about opening up a uh, uh, a bagel store with the intent of franchising it um, we looked at um, uh, franchise another franchise restaurant opportunities already a franchise that was that was out because we if you know, it was why would I want to invest in a franchise if we can make our own franchise if I, get, if I make my own franchise and we do a good job, my own restaurant and franchise it, we can make a hundred million dollars down the line. If I make a franchise and it does well, we could make a million dollars, but that's all we're going to make because we don't own it. All we can make is what the store makes. But if I but if I build a franchise, if I build a franchisable opportunity, we can make millions of dollars or billions like Chipotle. So you have to come up with a good concept that you can that you can. Um, Make a cookie cutter version of and set, set it around. So when you and you then when you're building a restaurant, then the important thing to do it's not about the building the restaurant or even the food. You have to build it in such a way where you think to yourself, this has to be able to be done by almost anybody who has some cooking skill, and it needs to be easy to set up, easy to assemble, consistent in quality. People have to like it in all different parts of the country because you can have an incredibly great successful thing. In one place, as you, as I'm sure you realize, like, there's tons of local restaurants that are great and blah blah blah. But could they franchise themselves? Would it work somewhere else? That's where you're running into trouble. But again, what's the best use of my money? So the best use of my money, my time and money, in this franchise opportunity for a restaurant, which was a great opportunity, but it's just a franchise, and it will make a ton of money, but it's limited in the upside. We have to put the same amount of time and effort into it. Now, setting up a brand new place that's franchisable 
will take the same amount of time and money, but the upside potential is 100 times more. Now, of course, your chance of failure is more also. You have to take that into account also. If, you, if you're open franchise, you have a better chance of success because it's a proven model. You know, basically buying McDonald's is, is a license to print money. You buy McDonald's, you, you, the chance of failing is, is, I think, one in a thousand. It's like 11,000 McDonald's. I don't think 10 a year fail. Um, so, you know, it, 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 but, 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 but a McDonald's franchise, probably $3 million all in by the time you do it. But you're going to make consistent 20% returns on your money. You got to work it. You got it's it's heavily involved. But but a successful McDonald's franchiser will have uh, one store, then they'll open another and another and another, and they keep rolling it up. And then by the time they're done, they have five, ten, you know, McDonald's under their belts, and they're making a freaking fortune. They're making as much money. If you have five McDonald's and they're all making twenty percent, so they're making like six hundred thousand a store. You're making three million a year when you started with a three million dollar store. Now you're making three million a year. That's great. That's a great life. It's a great path. But it's going to take you maybe 20 years to build up to that level. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing at all. I'm surprised more people don't do it. You know, it's, it's just considered not, for some reason, not considered a way that people want to be successful. But I, I, I've helped a lot of people put up franchises like that. And uh, hey, I'll tell you, it's a great way to be successful. It's uh, you know, it's it's funny because you don't you don't see a lot of people bragging like I own a bunch of McDonald's or whatever. But but it's an incredible way to make money. A friend of mine owns a bunch of Dunkin' Donuts, makes a fortune. Just keeps opening up little Dunkin' Donuts franchises. He controls like half our county's Dunkin' Donuts. You know, I don't nobody. It, 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 but but he is it, it, he's looked down on like the wall, like you know, I'm hanging out with Wall Street guys, and he's there, and they talk to him. They're like, well, "What do you do?" He goes, "Oh, I, I franchise Dunkin' Donuts." And they look, and he, he gets funny looks. He's got more money than all of them. <laughs> They're like, "Bro, oh, that's no way to make money." <laughs> but it, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about like you know, you want to find a way to make money. It's going to make you happy. And then, and, and, you know, for, for some people like playing with money and playing with numbers and buying stocks, some people like running and running little restaurants. Plus, for, first of all, I agree with him. I mean, I love the fact that he employs hundreds of people. That's great. You know, these Wall Street guys don't employ hundreds of people. They're just making money for themselves. They're not helping anybody. He's helping people. So, I mean, it's, it's just there's a lot of ways to make money. That's the bottom line. You have to always think about if you've got a limited supply of it, you have to think about what you're going to do with the next batch. And you've got to do the thing that's most likely to succeed. And it's going to, you know, you have to weigh that into account. What's most likely to succeed? Is this the best use of my money? A better opportunity to be coming down the road? Should I wait? You always got to consider these things. And every stock you should be thinking about that. Is this the best use of my money? Is this really such a good stock that I should be taking my hard-earned cash and putting it into this stock? Because if it's not, don't do it. So let's see. Avgo is taking off. Yeah, Broadcom is amazing. Um, <laughs> Randy says, it'll be interesting how POTUS handles these huge wet storms. Do not Google huge wet storms. <laughs> do not Google that, please. Um, you have to compete. Uh, yes, it's going to be incredible. Well, I look, this is the Trump team's incredible chance to impress people and handle this event well. And please God, they do. I certainly don't want to see them fail on this. This is an incredibly important event. We have a huge storm coming. I God, if any of you guys are in the, in the path of it, I hope you're going to stay safe. Um, it is um a huge devastating looking storm so where did we leave off on this oh my god look at all this stuff <laughs> okay what do you think ah there we were that's right games all right so i'm gonna watch this later of course but what is that Oh, weird. Oh. Are you kidding? 
What do you do? You set it up and it like watches you and then tells you how you did? That's cool. <laughs> and people playing AR games. I don't understand that stuff. I'm I see it's it's weird. It's starting to feel like my parents. Like I look at these things, I'm like, I don't know how to play that. I can't deal with it. All right, camera. Let's talk about how incredible the camera is. My my younger daughter is very into into photography. She's a phone photographer, which is a thing now, and um, she loves it. And she's she's all about that's that she would never even consider another phone because the Apple cameras apparently are just the most kick ass, and and all this stuff too. Look at what they're putting in now. Twelve MP. Oh my god, twelve megapixel wide angle camera. Holy crap. This is like better than the last real camera I had. Telephoto, how does it do telephoto? Two time zoom. Wow, one trillion operations per photo. That's insane. Smart HDR captures things in motion. That's going to be cool. What is that? Okay. Okay, woman in short front. Okay, that's cool. So what does it do? It gets better. Look at that. I don't know if I like that better, though, frankly. I don't know. I guess you can choose. I see my, my daughter does this crap with the phone. I can't even figure out how she gets these effects out of it. She can make it do all sorts of tricks. And then she posts them on, like, Instagram, and they're gone. Like, it's only for her friends in that, <laughs> it's only for her friends in that short amount of time, and then it's gone. And she likes that feature. She likes the, uh, the temporary sort of aspect of the thing. Keep two phone numbers, use two different plans, travel, what? Oh, dual SIM support, oh. I don't know, I have the, I have AT&T, and every time I go to a foreign country, they charge me 10 bucks a day, but I have my same plan, which is unlimited. So, yeah, and I travel quite a bit. I've been all over the world, and, and all AT&T ever does is charge me 10 bucks a day, you have to tell them you're doing it. It's like sign up for an international plan with at t And w when you're in the foreign country, you don't have to do any. Once you sign up for it, it's automatic. Whenever I go to a foreign country, if I make a phone call, then it initiates a $10 charge. So I was just on a cruise, and I didn't make a phone call three days, and I did make phone calls four days, and it only charged me for the four days I made phone calls. Um, when you're in the foreign country and you make a call or use your phone for data or whatever you're doing, um, then it charges you $10 on top of your regular service and everything else is the same. Like it's free to call anybody in the world. It's free to, you know, unlimited data and everything else. I, like, it's weird. It's too sim It's so simple. You can't believe it's true. I mean, it's not cheap. I guess it's 300 a month, but I, for, you know, when I travel, which is not, I don't travel for huge amounts of time. So it works out for me. I guess probably if you, are constantly in a foreign country, it wouldn't be very cost effective. But um, for, for the amount of, for, for as I travel, as I'm sometimes somewhere for five days or three days or something like that, it's perfect for me. Because I, I don't have to think about it. I just like use my phone like I always would. But I guess having two SIM cards, Europeans really care about this stuff, though. It's very important for Europeans to have uh, second SIM cards. For people in Asia too, probably the same problem. And that way, they, I don't know why they choose this image. It always makes it look like it's like some kind of weird bubble screen. But it's not. It's just the way the one screen looks on top of the other one. What is this? Uh, Apple runs 100% renewable energy. That's cool. Oh my God! Look at this thing. That's so cool. Wait, are they saying including the stores? <gasps> that includes the company's retail stores. Oh my God, is that great? 
100% renewable. How do they do that? How do they do that in a mall? Apple's trying to avoid mining materials from Earth. See, they won't select the recycling and things. Very nice. Good job, guys. Very pleased they still care about stuff. Okay, big stuff announced so far. The watch and the iPhone access. iPhones for 218 come in gold, silver, gray. Do they say when the phone is being delivered? I don't see that. Usually they show the phones with the prices. Maybe they get into that. Oh, well. So Apple, by the way, is in the butterfly portfolio, but we have at the moment, well, for the, for the while, we just had the aggressive play on Apple. Uh, it's a 180-220 bull call spread with 160 short puts. That one's already up quite a bit. It's, um, it's up 25, eight, that's eight, and three is about 11, it's up about $11,000 so far. Um, it was a net um, 18 minus five, so let's say 13. So it's a net $13,000 spread. It's currently up, I said $11,000, so it's up almost 100%. Ultimately, it can pay $40,000. So at, at most, it's gonna be 40,000 bucks. So I could make, we could make 30,000 bucks on the spread. And it's up eleven thousand so far, so it's only it's it's on track, so it's doing what it's supposed to do. We have not been um, we had not been tempted to sell Apple puts and calls, but it's the same concept in the butterfly portfolio. Ultimately, we will sell a few puts and calls once we decide where it's going to be after this uh, after they're done with this announcement and what they're doing, and we'll be able to make money on that. Now, Apple, you make an incredible amount of money selling puts and calls. So let's see, if we go back to Apple, you gotta be real careful with earnings because they have big, big moves on earnings. But let's say, I think the November earnings will be after, let's get rid of that. The November earnings are going to be after the, the uh, expiration here. So, see, they're at 221, and you can sell the 230 calls for, for six bucks, and you can sell the 210 puts for five bucks. So, your range then is 210 to 230, that you're betting on staying in this basic range. You're going to collect $11, which means it could be as low as 200 or as high as 240, and it doesn't hurt you. And if we sold just three of them, since it's $11 for the pair, that would be $3,300 collected as a bonus. Don't forget, it's only an $11,000 spread, and we're only selling 60 days worth of it for $3,000. For $3,300. So the rate of collection on Apple is insane. And, and Apple's not like, you see, and again, things that make us a good butterfly play, it's not likely to get bought out for a high price. That's how you get screwed. If something gets bought out for a really high price or if they go bankrupt, then the price flies to a certain level and flatlines and you can't make your money back. You just end up having to pay it off and, and find a new trade. So what you don't want in a butterfly play is a, is a company to get bought out from you or a company that goes bankrupt on you. Other than that, though, anything goes pretty much because you have such an incredible margin for error. Because when you were collecting, even with Apple, it was $11,000 spread to start with. If we if we steadily collected $3,300 a month or, or every other month, if we steadily collected $1,500 a month for 18 months, that's $24,000 against our $11,000 spread. And that's where you want to be with a butterfly. You want, to, you want to have a clear path. And we're only doing a one-third sale. We're selling three out of ten. So just doing that, just, just selling one third of what we have covered, we're able to collect um, whatever I just said, <laughs> 30, we're able to collect um, $30,000 or whatever against an $11,000 spread, or $24,000 against an $11,000 spread. Um, so that's two and a half times there, plus the spread could pay another $40,000. I, 
I, I, it, it, there is no easier way to make money. There is no more consistent way to make money than to set yourself up as a seller of premium to other people. You do not have to gamble. You can all, it's, it, it's like, if you go into a casino and the guy says to you, you hey, I tell you what, instead of playing the game, why don't you be the dealer? So here you sit down, you be the dealer, and you and you deal the cards, and then let everybody else sit down and play with you. Would you do it? And, and if you understand statistics, the answer is yes. You have to do that. That'd be crazy not to do that. That's how they made. That's how they built the casino. That's where they got their billions of dollars from. Simply sitting on the other side of the game, because each of the games, the rules are slightly in their favor. By the way, the best thing to do is is uh, roulette. Roulette, odd, the odds against you in roulette are insane. Like, oh, it's more than ten percent against you in roulette. I mean, I, first of all, because you only get paid thirty-five to one, but there's thirty-seven numbers on the wheel, so right away you're getting screwed. <laughs> so every time they spin that wheel, you're getting screwed by six percent. That's oh, I'm sorry, there's thirty. I'm sorry, there's thirty-eight numbers on the wheel. So it's three times, yeah, six, yeah, six and a half, it's about six and a half percent against you just on that. But then the odds on the other stuff make it even worse. So effectively, statistically, in a game like roulette, every single time they spin the wheel, they may as well take six percent of your money. And that means basically you have to luck out in the course of fifteen spins. If you don't luck out, you're going to be you're going to have zero. That's how badly the odds are against you. They, they just every time six percent against you, six percent against you, six percent against you. You don't realize it because what are you actually doing? You've got a you've got a hundred dollars and you bet ten and you lose sixty cents. You don't realize you're losing sixty cents because it's a statistical loss. It's not a real loss because you only lose you lose when the, when it goes against you when it's not your number when you pick the wrong number right you lose and you win when you win the right number. But the point is whether you win or lose, they're basically stealing an extra sixty cents every time. So when you win, you only get back nine dollars and forty cents, and when you lose, you lose all of your money. You lose the entire ten percent that you put on the table. So obviously, won't be long before you have no money. Anybody who plays roulette probably knows that. You you will lose the money you play with. It's incredibly rare to walk away from a roulette table with your money. And and you have to have quite a bit of discipline to do it. So why don't we be the dealer? Why should we be the why be the gambler? It makes no sense. It's so easy in this game, in options, it's so easy to be the dealer. There's no penalty to it. There's no, and, and it's not an investment. I don't have to build a whole casino and advertise and give out free drinks. There's tons of people like you who are willing to make, make bets at my casino. I can take up almost any position I can imagine, and I'll have to find somebody to bet against me. And that's what it's all about. So I, I cannot emphasize enough. You know what? You know that you guys got to focus on those fundamentals. I don't want to see anybody here talking about their blood pressure and their worries. I mean, all this freaking future stuff. We we don't talk about the long positions a lot because they're boring. They're, they we just stick them in the portfolio and we wait to make money. There's not a lot of thought process going into these things. The thing we end up talking about is the futures plays, but the futures plays are, are just the it's a craps game. It's just fun. It's not where you're supposed to be trying to make all your money. You know, meanwhile, here's 250 bucks. <laughs> so, like I said, here's where I should take the. All right, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I sometimes I say I should, and then nobody nobody pays attention. So I'm going to actually do it. So here's where I said I wanted to get back to even. So I'm going to buy back the the short option. Yeah, let's say here. Oh, you bastard! Oh, the Nymex is about to close. Yeah. All right. No, I'm not. I'm not. I refuse to go higher, so I'm going to take it off. If they don't fail me, I'm going to wait. The Nymex is closing right now. So I would say they're probably trying to keep it up as high as they can.
So I was going to say, I was going to buy it back here, not higher, so I'm not going to pay more. I'm going to buy it back here. I have one contract, and then I can go to sleep and let the one contract do whatever it does. If it goes up, I'll be happy to double down again. See, it was fake. As soon as I put my, as soon as I click, though, they shot it up because they want me to chase it. Don't do that. And I say they, it's an algorithm. There's an algorithm there that's faking most of these orders. Most of the stuff you see here is fake. There's no real buyer, no real seller. It's just an algorithm offering high and bidding low and hoping to catch somebody who's stupid enough to pay one of those prices. Oh, see? So I'll try it again. I'll put it in. I'm the only, now I'm the guy. See, there it goes. And it filled. That was me. So I was the only one there. So now I'm back to my one contract. I've got a, a profit at the moment of 245 bucks a day. And now I could happily go to sleep. I don't care. So I don't have to watch it. If it goes up to 206, I'm happy to double down and ride it out. And if it goes down to 202, I'm going to make some good money anyway. And that's it. I mean, because because again, I had a great day. I had, and that's the other thing. I have, I already made $4,000 today. This is just like bonus money. I don't need to make this like a focus of how I expect to make money today. This is just a little extra that we're putting on the side. So now we'll see how that goes. But that's that's what you do. So the reason, the only reason you're doubling down is to is to make a better basis for yourself. And then once you get back to it, don't forget to take your profit off. Don't forget to get, take the extra money off the table. You're not here to take risk. You're here to make money. Concentrate on making money, not on adding risk. So how's the rest of the market doing? Ah, <sighs> still down. Oh no, what's going on? Where's the magic, uh, the magic turnaround? Oh, sorry, I got the TV on. There you go. <clears throat> wow, they're really pumping this storm, huh? It's only category three now. Late Thursday to late Friday, I'm supposed to fly to Florida on Saturday morning. On Saturday, that's Saturday afternoon, actually. I hope they don't like mess up all my flights. Boy, I'm self-absorbed, right? <laughs> that's all I care. North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland have all had evacuations. Millions could be without power for weeks. I hope not. What is wrong with this country that we don't have a, a plan for this sort of thing? Okay, so you'll have to compete for your time with that. If you're traveling overseas, get a Google number for free and forward your regular phone to the Google number. You can receive calls anytime you have internet. Oh, I didn't know about that. That's useful. So Sri says, if you are traveling overseas, get a Google number for free forward your regular phone to the Google number and you can receive calls anytime you have internet. I don't even know what a Google number is, but that's something worth uh, looking into. Uh, Brendan says, do you think the OPK investment is done when the stock opens? I don't know exactly what's going on over there. I know that's something we, we do have some OPK. Fortunately, it's on a big position, but... Um, I'm not quite understanding what, what's going on, frankly. He's, they're being charged with manipulating the stock. It's not, it's not open, I take it. It's not trading. It seems odd because the, the whole company, I mean, the guy who owns it is a billionaire, but maybe it's, he's a billionaire tied up mostly in his own company. It just seems unlikely he'd want to participate in some kind of stupid stock fraud. Um, but on the other hand, though, there could be stock manipulation going on, and you could just your 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 issue as an as the owner of the company is um, is that you just weren't paying attention while other people were committing fraud. That's also not good. So here's their comment. Let's see what they say about this. 
The exchange advised them to hold or continue until the company responds to the exchange's request for information to, to a lawsuit filed by the SEC against a number of individuals and entities, including our current CEO. Uh, the lawsuit does not contain any allegation about their practices. Alco is confident once the proper investigation is complete, the facts of the case have been disclosed. It will be resolved favorably for the company. They are working expeditiously to respond to the NASDAQ's request. It cannot estimate when the trading will resume. I don't know. It's the same. It's the same. No information that we that we had before. I mean, it's not clear what actually is going on. It seems like there's been some serious allegations made. The SEC has is investigating it. They asked for documents, and Opco, for whatever reason, did not turn over the the documents, and so the um, so they're being shut down. Here's the comments on the SEC complaint. They learned that the SEC filed a lawsuit in the Southern District against individuals, including Opco. Um, the SEC failed to provide notice of its intent to sue prior to filing, which contains fact. Well, of course, they're going to say that contains factual inaccuracies. Had the SEC followed its own standard procedures, they would have provided the information. Da da da. Okay, apparently, though. So what they're saying is, because you sued us, we have to do follow procedures to turn things over. But unfortunately, the SEC is putting screws to them by halting their stock. I don't know. It, it just it doesn't smell right to me. It's something like it, not not bad about the company. To me, it just doesn't seem likely that they would go to all this trouble to to defraud some people. It just seems like an odd thing. But it's possible that some people in the company did do something that was wrong, and the whole company's going to suffer for it. Basically, so there's, there's honestly no way to know. But you know, we we saw uh, you know VRX and Theranos are just like giant scams, and they didn't they they didn't open <laughs> they didn't open up at zero. <laughs> they still they still hang on. Um, it takes a lot to kill a company. These, these corporate entities are immortal beings, but that's that's a nasty turndown. But, you know, because you don't know what it is when you hear fraud, SEC investigation, blah, blah, blah. Of course, the stock's going to go like that. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't, I haven't had enough information to make a decision on that guy yet. It's not something I'm going to jump right in and try to buy. Um, I think the only place we have it is in the long-term portfolio, which, frankly, you know, I mean, again, because of the diversity, it could, you know, we could care less. It's going to be very much. It's up 40% at the moment. Um, and again, these are long-term positions. We barely touch them, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's for this year, because we just started this year. So currently, OPK is showing all zeros. It's all messed up. Um, we have 30 of the um, three seven bull call spreads that we paid net a dollar for. So we're at four. So four is our break even there. But we did sell the five puts, but we sold the five puts for $2. So our net is three. So, you know, the worst thing that can happen to us, we're going to be forced to buy. In fact, cost-wise, we have 54 minus 24 is 3 minus 2. So we spent $1,000 on this position. And um, the worst thing that can happen to us is we end up owning $5,000. A thousand times five is five. We end up owning $5,000 worth of stock. So our, our maximum damage on the spread is the 1000 we spent plus 5000 that gets assigned to us is $6,000. And let's say it's at zero, we lose six thousand bucks. We could have made, had all gone well, we would have made um, four times thirty is twelve thousand. We would have had twelve thousand dollars back on our one thousand. So the upside was eleven thousand. And the worst case on this spread, if OPK went to zero, was that we would lose six thousand. So again, as I said before. If all my plays are two to one reward to risk ratios, then losing one is not the end of the world. So even though this is now zeroed out in the long-term portfolio, we're still showing that it's, uh, not, it's not killing us. We are at a maximum. This, should, this trade is currently showing the worst case scenario. 
but it barely affects the long-term portfolio because it's a small piece of it. It's very diversified. 5,000 bucks is nothing in the long-term portfolio. It's 1% of the portfolio. So would I rather be up 5% than down 5%? Of course I would, but that's, you know, we'll see what happens. But you just have to look at these things in, in the context of where you are in your, in your positions. So we have um, 38 spreads in the long-term portfolio. You know, it cracks me up. People people say, oh, you're bearish. I'm like, how am I bearish when I have 38 long positions and, and four, four more um, dividend stocks and 20 short puts? That's our long-term portfolio. We're extremely bullish. The bearishness is in, is in the hedges, which are in the short-term portfolio. And the short-term portfolio is up 125%. So I guess we were right to be bearish because we make a lot more money in our bearish portfolio. But <laughs> so it varies where the money is, but that's not true though. The fact is we take a lot of chances in the short term portfolio that make some quick money um, because, and again, because the, the, the short term portfolio starts off with one fifth of the money of the long term portfolio. So the long term portfolio started off with half a million bucks on January 2nd. The short term portfolio started out with $100,000. The main job of the short term portfolio is to protect the long term portfolio. So we're looking for plays that make money when the market goes down to offset losses in the long term portfolio. But the market hardly ever goes down. But what we do is take certain plays that should do well if the market doesn't go up, like this Tesla short like that, like this oil play that we took over here at CO, like, uh, and then we've got the TZA hedge and the SCO hedge, things like that. But over the course of the year, we shorted Amazon, we shorted uh, Tesla, we shorted um, Netflix. So there are certain plays we made $10,000, $20,000, $30,000 on like that. That's where the money's really coming from, not so much the short hedges, although we did have that really horrific drop uh, earlier in the year that we made some good money on too. But it's just a matter of keeping a balance. So, so we instead of keeping the balance in the long-term portfolio, it's less confusing. We keep a short-term portfolio. That's where we keep our hedges. And, and again, it goes back to the same thing. People think I'm bearish because I talk about the hedges more than I talk about our long plays. But I don't have to worry about a long place. I'm always going to talk about the thing I'm worried about. I'm worried about being, I'm worried about not being well covered enough. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about whether or not my long-term plays are good. My long-term plays are fantastic. Obviously, they're up 40% for the year. And that's, by the way, consistent because, right, the, um, the butterfly portfolio is up 40%. The long-term portfolio, is, no, I'm sorry, butterfly is up about 30 something, 35 percent. Long-term, the long-term portfolio is up 40 percent. The um, money talk portfolio is up, um, whatever the hell it was, up se up 70 percent. Uh, that one got lucky. The uh, options opportunity portfolio is up like 30 percent. So the all the long portfolios are up about 30 percent, outperforming the market. And uh, and then the short term portfolio is, it happens to be up 100 percent just because we made some clever plays. But that's not I'm not bearish, but we but the plays we worry about are the plays that that are bearish. Those are the ones we look at a lot because we either get add them, subtract them, change them, move them, whatever. But the long term positions are, are set and forget. They should be in a good market like this. But the best aspect of it, though, is the more trades we have, the more premium we're selling. This is the casino aspect of what we do. We have more trades. We sell more premium. We collect more money. And as we keep collecting money every month from dozens and dozens of different games that we're playing, it's very hard for us to lose because even the losses are offset by all the collections that we're making from others. And that's how it should be, though. This is not supposed to be a guessing game. This is supposed to be a business. And the business is making money using stocks. Not the stock doesn't have to make money. You have to make money. And the best way to make money using stocks is to sell premium to other people. Leverage the stock you have, sell the premium to people who want to take the bets, and you collect the money. There's no stress in that at all. The stress comes from when you're gambling. Don't gamble. Okay, we play the futures, the futures are for having fun.
they're gambling. You should absolutely not be playing the futures with any kind of money that you're worried about. It could easily go either way at any given time. Sri says, what are your thoughts on NXPI? Only if you have time. Well, I do not have time. You can ask me in chat. But my thoughts on NXPI are that they got way overboard. So I don't see anything wrong with the fact that they came down. Um, NXPI. I mean, this, this was a silly run. They went from, from 80 to 125, that's up 50%, and now they're back to 80. I, I don't, look, I, I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm an old fart now, because I don't understand how people value things. But, but by the way, this is what's going to happen to the whole market, though. $30 billion at 90. So $30 billion is how much you have to pay for this company. Yet, they only have $9 billion in revenue. That's a, that's a red flag right away to me. They make $3 billion. So that's nice that they drop $3 billion to the bottom line. But uh, 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 they don't make $3 billion. Look at this. I'm sorry, not three. I'm sorry, it's 2.2. Um, this is something people don't understand about earnings. When you look at earnings and you see shit like this, you see uh, minus $500 million of taxes. I don't care what legitimate reason they have for having minus 500 million in taxes, okay? That's not money they made. That's some kind of tax adjustment. That is not an indication of how good this company is. It's, a, it's an indication of how good their accountant is, but you know, with Goldman Sachs, you can take that into account. But seriously, though, that's money they're taking from the federal government. That's not going to be the normal source of income. Their real income is, is $1.7 million. But even so, at $30 billion, wait. Yeah, if you extrapolate that out, you think it's an incredible amount of money. You think they're doing really good because it'll make $2.2 billion, But they're really making – you have to not just look at, like, not getting the refund, but you have to say, well, if they, if they made $1.7 billion, $1.8 billion normally, what would a normal company pay on taxes on something like that? They're going to pay at least 20%, you would think. <laughs> and so if they pay 20%, they're go and, and by the way, when you see this also, it's because they wrote off a lot of crap. And if they wrote off a lot of crap and got themselves a refund, it means down the road they won't have anything to write off. And that means that they won't be able to get these fancy tax breaks later on. Um, so if they paid a normal amount of 20% on $1.8 billion, that'd be about three sixty. dollars So let's say $1.5. Now that means that's a PE of about 20 at $30 billion which is as much as you'd ever want to pay for a semi-company. Now look at the analysis and see what they think for, for earnings per share. They've done a lot of buybacks and because, again, they're, but they're dropping six bucks to the bottom line. They think it's going to continue into next year. But I don't think so. I think they're wrong. And I, oops, wrong thing. Um, let's look at the quarterlies. I don't see how they're going to sustain this. So once, no, and they're not. See how this is complete? This is bullshit, and the analysts are idiots because they think they're going to make the same amount of money. The sales are consistent. See the sales? The sales are consistent, but what happened to the profits? They normalized. And they're not going to make this fucking, they're not going to make $768 million in, in Q4. They're not going to get another massive tax refund. So the people who analyze this company are morons, and the people who bought it are morons who spent that kind of money for it. They are not going to make enough money to sustain this valuation. This was all stupid. This is what they're worth. This is These people were right. These people are idiots. That's the way it goes. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, it's time to wrap it up. Uh, okay, okay, good. I'm really happy. Um, one more check on the Apple people, and then we'll wrap it up. They ought to be done by now. Thank you for tuning in. Yes, where are we? Oh, there is pricing. Good. Where do we leave off? What is that? Oh, that's just the way it looks inside. Did we look at this already? A12 Bionic, ambient light sensors, haptic touch. No, we didn't look at that. Did we liquid retina? Ugh. This is like tech porn for me. I, I just, I'm so into like all the tech that they do in this stuff. It's just great. Unbelievable. Edge to edge LCD. That's a big deal because it gives you much better aspects. Um, liquid retina, whatever that means. Huge display. I don't know how that proves it's a huge display, but apparently. Um, oh, by the way, this thing, this notch thing, does not bother you at all once you own the phone. I don't understand why people ever. It's I guess, I guess it looks weird if you're just looking at it in the display and you think it's going to bother you, but it, you'd never even think about it. And and it makes it makes it able to do so much stuff that it's uh, obviously worth it. Okay, they got a wide angle camera. That's gonna be nice. Wide angle camera is a nice addition. Although the, the thing that I use is panoramic. You can take a picture and um just sort of like turn the camera. You know, you don't you don't even have to be steady really, you just kind of have to swivel the camera around and the pan, you know, just from end to end, just keep sh shooting across and it stitches the picture together for you and makes it um it adjusts, so if you wobble your hand, it only just makes it, it, it just picks up the part that was steady in the middle. Um, but um, you can easily take a sweep, like I do that all the time when I'm on trips, I take a sweeping picture, and it comes up the coolest panoramic image that it saves, so you can view it that way, and if you print, amazing. Um, Apple, okay, arsenic-free, mercury, okay, environmentally friendly, blah, 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 blah. Takes amazing pictures, we know that. Okay, iPhone X, I, I'm sorry, but I have no idea what, which phone is which. Um, whatever that is, it's seven, I guess that's a cheap one, the 750. The iPhone Max, oh, here you go. From, so, the, so no memory is 1,000, I'd say it's probably because it's like 15 at that point. I'm good with two. I two fifty six is fine. Sixty four I can't do. Two fifty six is good for me. Did he tell you here XR? Nope. Oh, here you go, Max. No, they don't actually specify how much more it is to get more memory. Oh wait, can be pre ordered on the fourteenth. Ships on the twenty first. Oh, my daughter has got to be sitting by the phone right now. So now, oh, look at this, iPhone 7, oh my God. And when I had the iPhone 6, I was so thrilled with it. See, this is the thing people don't get about Apple. They're moving, they, they move into the lower price points over time. So the longer the phone line keeps going, and it's been 10 years, right? The longer the phone line goes, the cheaper they have. And they, so they've got phones that can be free with a phone plan. You can get an iPhone 7 for zero, just like any kind of uh, Android phone. And an iPhone 7 is a kick-ass phone. It just ain't no 10. <laughs> but that's that's how they push everyone else out of the market. All their competitors, they, they've got a line of old stuff that they can produce very cheaply. It's all like the hand-me-down phones. And they're and those are getting down below 500 bucks. They're, they're, you know, people criticize them because their X's are um, 1,000 bucks, 1,100 bucks. So what? That's for the people who want to spend that kind of money. And there's plenty of those people. It's not like the Samsung phones are cheap. You know, not the top of the line ones. What is this? Uh, oh, it's talking about TV, air power. Oh, wait, what's this? So no iPads. Yeah, I thought they were going to talk about iPads. That's it. No, nope, apparently they ended it. 
Oh, I'm disappointed. I thought I was going to get a new iPad. Oh, well. So what happened to Apple stock while all this is going on? Uh, let's see. Oh, down around 220. So not much damage. They, it's, it's disappointing they don't have new iPads, but it's not a big deal. I think that they're going to kick ass with the phones and the watches. Um, so certainly, you know, if Apple comes down, it's a buy. It's a buy no matter what, though. It's going to be, you know, they should be trading around 250 by next year. So, you know, it's easy to set up a spread and pick something up there. All right. So I think that's going to do it for the day. Let me see if there's any more questions. Uh-oh, somebody said something. Um... LG V30 does something like that as well. Oh, the phone. Okay, well, no, that's not a question. <laughs> so Randy says the LG uh, V30 phone does something like that as well. And it's, it's nice, but I mean, I, again, um, I'm used to using the Apple. I love the Apple. I have no desire to switch at all. And it's not for lack of checking. I do look at other phones because I always look. If there's something really better, I want it. You know, I'm not at all loyal in computers. I have a, I'm right now doing this conference on an HP. My new big, my new conference computer is a Dell, which I absolutely love. Um, I, I, I had an iMac and I, I actually ended up giving it to my daughter. I, was, I wasn't using it as much as my PCs. So I'm really a PC guy, but the freaking the phone line and the iPad, I could never do without it. It's amazing. It's like just incredible stuff. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. I hope that was uh, semi-informative. Really, really, really though, you guys got to work on the on the long-term stuff and on the butterfly stuff and the be the house concept. It's so critical. This should not be stressful. That's what I want to stress today. This should not be stressful. This should be fun. You should be enjoying yourself. You should be investing and having fun and checking your portfolio and it goes up and down a little, but you shouldn't be worried about whether or not you have money on a day-to-day -day basis. That's crazy. Invest sensibly. Don't gamble. All right. Thanks everybody for coming and we'll do it again uh, next week. Thanks.